dear loved ones and friends in the Lord Jesus, I want to bring another little meditation to our hearts to encourage our souls and our spirits together. I've been thinking in these last few days just about the change in our eating habits. We've been eating some of us different food and we've been maybe going more to the butchers than we used to and maybe doing more home cooking. And maybe for some of us who are blessed with a wife who's been gifted in a certain way, we've been getting more home baking. Whether that's a good thing or not, I'm not sure. But we've certainly been enjoying a slightly different kind of diet and a slightly different outlook on our food and our eating habits. My mind was turned to John's Gospel. We're going to read in John's Gospel in chapter number two. My mind was turned to the signs in John. John does not ever use the miracle word. He only ever in all his writing speaks of signs. And that means that it's not so much the miracle that the Lord Jesus Christ did. It is the meaning behind the miracle itself, what the miracle is pointing to. And John in his gospel, we know that he only gives us one sign that has already been recorded in the other gospels. Maybe we'll come to some of that in another session. But what I was thinking about was that three of the signs that John gives us in his gospel has to do with food situations and actually specifically the lack of food in certain circumstances. So let's read together about the first sign in John chapter 2 and we'll see if we can come to some lessons and some encouragement and some little pointers towards the majesty and power of the Lord Jesus Christ at his first sign when he made up that which lacked in relation to the food in this situation in John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour has not come yet. His mother said to the ministering servants, Whatsoever he says unto you, do. There were sitting there. The word really is lying. Not so much standing up as lying down. There were lying there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. And Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of feast, the master of the ceremonies, and they bear. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the ministering servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and then when men have well drunken that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed in him. We know that God blesses the reading of his word to our hearts together. The first thing that I want to speak about in relation to this passage is the presence of the master. It says it was the third day. We're not absolutely clear in terms of the chronology of John's gospel whether that was three days after the four days in John chapter 1. It could mean at a very basic level the third day after Jesus came back into Galilee or it could actually mean just as it appears to be on the surface of the word of God four days in Judea and then two days of travelling perhaps up into Galilee and then on the third day. So it's not impossible that the four days in John 1 are directly connected to the third day in John 2. Either way, what the Spirit of God has given us either by commission or by omission is four days and three days which make a seven. And it's not insignificant that this marriage took place on the seventh day. 
that's typical, that's instructive. We'll also see in relation to numerics, there weren't seven water pots, there were only six. But on the third day, or perhaps the seventh day, there was a marriage. The typical teaching in this passage has really got nothing whatsoever to do with the church. We shouldn't be too greedy when we come to the word of God. We can make application from any passage, but we have to be careful with interpretation. This is Jewish. This was about what was lacking in the nation in the lifetime of the Lord Jesus. And this is about the restoration that he could and would effect. Looking forward to the day when they would sit down with him and rejoice together at his marriage in the kingdom that is to come. Well, we're here in the background because the church is the bride. But it's interesting, there's no mention of a bride in this marriage story. The bridegroom is here, the master of ceremonies is here, the disciples are here, the guests are here, the mother of Jesus is here, and Jesus himself is here. Mostly unacknowledged, mind you. That's interesting. Not a great thing to start off a marriage in which Christ himself is not acknowledged. But if we look at the presence of the master, we can see there's a typical aspect to it. Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. The second thing we see in the passage is there was a problem at the marriage. Isn't it well that Jesus was there? Not only was he there, but his mother was there. I think that's every bit as significant as well. When they wanted wine, it says in verse number three, the margin reading says the wine having failed. That is, it wasn't just so much that the wine ran out. It was the wine did not do the job that it had been intended for. See, wine in scripture is not intended for drunkenness. Wine in scripture is intended to bring joy and happiness and merriment, kept in its right context. And in this marriage, whatever was wrong, the wine had failed. It wasn't the master of ceremonies, mind you, he was in charge of all that took place. It wasn't the master of ceremonies who discerned that the wine had failed. It doesn't even say it was the ministering servants who discerned that the wine had failed. And by the grace of God, it wasn't the guests who discerned the wine had failed. It seems to be that there was a woman here with a shepherd heart. Dare I even say the heart of a deacon s because the word servant here really is ministering servant it's the first time the word deacon is used in the new testament the ministering servants are really the word that we use over in the new testament in relation to the church context the deacons those who ministered to the needs of others it wasn't them that noticed that the wine had failed it was a woman with a shepherd heart. It was a mother in Israel. It was a woman with the heart of a deaconess. Did she go and make a fuss about it? Did she go or tell, tell her friends and her neighbours and the other guests? No, the interesting thing is this. When there was a problem in the marriage, it was first of all the mother of Jesus that discerned it first. And secondly, and this is most important, it was to him. Yes, he was her son. He was her firstborn. But she herself knew absolutely and truly without a doubt that he was divinely begotten, the son of God. And in her heart she said, if there's anyone that can fix the problem here, it will be him. I take the problem to him. I leave it at his feet. I whisper it in his ear. I think that shows great faith. I don't think that in the days of his childhood and early life there had been any kind of superficial miracles performed in the home. I think if he made a yoke at the carpenter's bench, he made it in real time and worked and laboured and sweated too. Mind you, the yoke would have been a perfect fit. Matthew 11 tells us that. Because he knew perfectly and had made the beast on which the yoke would go. 
but I think it was done in real time and done with rigorous labor. I don't think there had been any manifestation of sign in 30 years. I think Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus, she's working here in absolute faith. The presence of the master, the problem at the marriage, the proposal of his mother. She comes to him and she says to him effectively, I know that you can do something about it. We come to a little phrase that uh, an awful lot of the writers seem to have a problem with. They stumble and struggle over it. Jesus said to her, woman, what is it to you and to me? Mine hour has not come yet. Mind you, when John uses that word for hour, he's often speaking about the arrest and crucifixion and humiliation and torture and trial of the Lord Jesus. Mine hour has not yet come. Later on in John, he does say, this is your hour and the power of darkness. Maybe the reason that he calls her woman is absolutely not because of disrespect. That can't be in question. He's speaking to Mary as representative of the nation and how the nation is going to respond to the signs that he will do and how the nation is going to respond to the claims that he will make. And whether the nation believes in him or not when he manifests forth his glory, that time in its fullness has not yet come. And so he says to his mother, what is it to you and to me? Mine hour has not come yet. His mother turned to the ministering servants in spite of what he had said. His mother turns to the ministering servants and she says to them, whatsoever he says, whatever he tells you to do, don't question it. Even you don't understand it, just do it. We come now not to the proposal of his mother, but to the pronouncement of the method. John describes it for us because John is here. He's a first-hand eyewitness because he's one of the early disciples and these first half-dozen disciples of the Lord Jesus that had followed him in John chapter 1, they're with him at the marriage. John says he's describing the scene for us. He's describing it for Gentiles that are going to come afterwards that might not understand the ceremonies of the Jews. John uses a very specific term. The King James translated it sitting. But John says, no, that's not the word I want. There were lying. You say it doesn't make much of a difference. Well, in relation to a stone water pot, it absolutely does. You see, a stone water pot sitting vertically, you wouldn't have to be too many metres away from it before you couldn't tell whether it was full or half full or empty. But a stone water pot lying on its side, not one single person at the marriage would not be able to understand this. It's empty, it's dry, it's barren, it's hard, and it's cold, and it's stony, and there's nothing there of any sustenance, and there's nothing there of any refreshment, and there's nothing left in it to do anybody any good or not. Whether it was for purification, whether the ceremonial purification effected any benefit or not is not the point. They were empty, they were lying there, Six water pots of stone. And even the six is a significant number because it's just the number of man. And no matter how hard man tries, he never can, by his own effort, elevate himself to the level of his creator, his God, or can bring anything to a level of completeness or perfection. Because that's the number seven. And only God can bring things to a level of completeness and perfection and rest containing two or three firkins apiece. As best we understand the calculations of that day, that's something round about 50 litres. Mind you, that's worthy of a pause because these ministering servants, not only are they going to have to respond to an instruction that they don't really understand how it's going to work, but they're going to have to work in perfect harmony and perfect unity. 
they're going to have to fill a pot that when it's filled will weigh 50 litres of content. Plus the weight of a stone pot and if you've gone to a garden centre and the plastic pots are fine but if you've gone to a garden centre and tried to lift a stone pot I'll tell you that sometimes even when the pot is empty you need help and put 50 litres in the pot. It might not even take two men to lift, it might even take three. And I'll tell you this, a three-man lift is sometimes far more complicated to coordinate and organise than a two-man lift. I don't know how many men it took to move these pots when they were filled with water. I wouldn't have been disappointed in them or surprised if they just about filled them three quarters full. And Jesus just told them to fill them. He didn't specify how much. Isn't it amazing their response? They're absolutely desirous in their heart to do as much as possible in obedience as ministering servants to what he has requested them to do. Mind you, that's a great lesson, isn't it? They filled them close to the top in case they splashed something out. No, they filled them absolutely to the brim. I'll tell you this, just inside a second or two, they're going to discover the benefit and the blessing of having filled them to the brim. Because every single thing that was put inside the pot by their human effort, he is going to bless and he is going to sanctify by divine effort. And because they filled them to the brim, they were brimful with new wine and they were brimful with blessing. And he said unto them, draw out and bear unto the governor of the feast, the master of ceremonies. Now we're looking at the practice of the ministering servants. And bear now to the governor of the feast. And they bear. And the ruler of the feast tasted the water that was made wine. And he did not know. I tell you, I don't think this man was keeping a very close eye on his job. He didn't even see what the ministering servants were at. Or perhaps it was that these Deacon servants were doing the thing in such, not a secretive, but a quiet manner. Mind you, it's lovely in relation to the things of God when things are done in a quiet manner, not with a trumpet sound. When something has just slipped through the door. When a phone call is made in private that nobody else knows about. When a communication, not everything's done in public. When a communication of any kind is sent in private and we just try to uplift and encourage and help another one maybe who's slightly down and we don't need to get on the phone afterwards and tell somebody else that we've done it. These men did their work for Christ in such a way that the man who was sitting on an elevated position at the wedding feast for so he would have been and the bridegroom too and the bride though she's not mentioned they had no idea the work that the ministering servants had done. If I was looking for another heading, I would speak about the perplexity of the ceremony master. And so we said for the ministering servants, which had drawn out the water, which had been made wine. And they bare it to him. And the ruler of the feast tasted it, and he didn't know where it came from, but the ministering servants knew. And then he sent for the bridegroom. He presumed, you see, that the bridegroom was the source of this blessing. No, he wasn't. He presumed that the bridegroom had paid the bill but had mixed up in terms of what had been served first. Most men at the wedding, he served, said, serve the best wine at the beginning when men have got sensitivity of taste and discernment. And after they've drunk a certain amount, that's just human thinking, isn't it? After they've drunk a certain amount, their discernment and their taste is diluted and diminished and you're able to bring in cheaper stuff. I tell you this, dear child of God, when we come to the study of the Word and the study of his book, there is no cheaper stuff. There is no dilution and there is no diminution. The more we read and the more we study and the longer we spend in it and the more hours we spend in his Word, and the longer we tire out our bodies and tire out our eyes, for we are physically deficient, I'll tell you this, the sweeter it grows and the better it gets. And we often find we just close the book and we bow our head and shame at our own weakness. And we just say, I've found a little fresh thought for myself. The good wine has been kept 
to the last. And the bridegroom had no idea whatsoever. He had no answer to the situation. This beginning of miracles. Now we come to the purpose. Here's my last heading. The purpose of the miracle. Oh yes, it was practical. It was to take away the embarrassment and the difficulty and the problem at the wedding. It wasn't only practical, it was also prophetic. It's speaking of that which he will do in the sacrifice of Calvary and his redemption, what he will do in relation to the restoration of the nation. That's long in the future and it's still in the future yet. But there is a third reason, the practical reason and the prophetic reason. But here I think is the primary reason because we're told it right in the passage. Verse number 11, John says by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this beginning, this, the commencement of the signs did Jesus in Cana and Galilee and manifested forth his glory. That's a lovely word allowed a little tiny glimpse of his glory on divine purpose to shine out. And the people ran after him. And the wedding people were mesmerized. And the people flocked to receive more wine. Those other kind of things will happen in the future. There is another food miracle and people just followed afterwards because they assumed that as long as they followed Jesus they could get free food. But that's not the primary purpose here, nor was it the primary purpose there. This beginning of signs did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and a handful of men, maybe not more than half a dozen, but every single one of them are of primary importance to the one who was Messiah. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed in him. You say, Brother David, they already had believed in chapter 1. That's why they followed. Did Andrew not go and find Peter? Yes, he did. Did Philip not go and find Nathaniel? Yes, he did. Did John and Andrew not follow the pointing finger of the Baptist? Yes, they did. Did they not all follow the Lord Jesus Christ and leave behind their daytime activity and become permanent followers of the Messiah? Yes, they did. But these are early days and they need to be truly convinced not only of who he is and what he is and why he has come. They need to be truly convinced of the source of their faith and the direction in which their faith is looking. And even though they have believed, he already is going now in this first sign. He's not focusing upon the wedding and the request of his mother and the saving of the embarrassment of the bridegroom. He's focusing on that little handful of followers who have already come after him. This beginning of signs. Did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, manifesting forth a little glimpse of his glory. Oh, they're going to see it again and again. And their faith was confirmed. And their belief was strengthened. And his disciples believed on him. As we read the gospel records, as we read the word of God, as we come like simple children to the word of God and study him on every page, Christ and all the scriptures, we trust that we will be like these early disciples that sat at the outside of the fringes of the marriage ceremony at Cana and Galilee. His disciples saw the manifestation of his glory and they believed on him. May the Lord bless these meditations to all our hearts.